Special thanks to Mara Lynn Johnstone for the story. Please check them out in the description below. Now on to the story. They sign said, Earthling wanted in large print. And I, a perfectly eligible Earthling, said, Heck yeah. Busy space station life bustled around me as I stepped close to read the details on the hollow board. Other ads were for the usual range of odd jobs and social events, but this one was specific, and it couldn't have been more perfect for me. A courier ship was contracted to deliver someone's pet cat to them in deep space. I guessed that a breakup had happened while the owner was away, or their temporary job had turned into a permanent one, and while the couriers were perfectly capable of getting the cat there. This was several days of travel, and they hadn't the first idea of how to care for an earth animal. Well, I thought with no small amount of smugness, they just got themselves an expert. I copied the hollow ad onto my phone, then found a vaguely private corner of a public seating area and activated the call. I stood up straight and professional, as if I was meeting a wealthy new client with an ailing Samoyed. Would they want a detailed resume? A rundown of the places I'd worked and trained? My range of expertise on animals big and small? Or perhaps a description of what I would do in various unexpected scenarios? Nope. The octopus-like alien, who popped into view, deep green, harried, and female, unless I missed my guess, only had two questions for me. Great, you look like an earthling, she said. How experienced are you in caring for cats? Very, I said, ready to add more. Oh good, can you leave immediately? Yes, I decided, thinking quickly. I just have to grab my things. Where's your ship? Meet us at the semi-aquatic spaceport before the shadow covers it. She glanced at something off screen. We leave before the solar sails have to fold. Be quick. With that, the call ended. I blinked once, then shoved the phone into my pocket and sprinted down the corridor. Passers-by stepped aside and gave me disapproving looks, especially the group of red-pink bug folk who chattered after me in their own language. But I dodged through the loose crowd without hitting anyone. Nearly tripped over a smaller-than-average water wheel, which could have been disastrous given their column of jello consistency, but I hopped on by with a quick apology. Are water wheels really that fragile? I wondered as I ran. My biological studies had all been earth-based. I knew the best way to hold a chameleon, pet a cat, and catch a chicken, but I hadn't the foggiest idea how the friendly blob monsters worked. Well, maybe I'd find out. I skidded into my small room and threw things into the suitcase. There wasn't much to pack since this was a temporary stop. Five minutes ago, I'd been planning to trudge back to Earth and look for a new job. My old workplace was under new management and doing a reshuffling that made for a perfect time to take a quick lap around the galaxy, something I'd always wanted to do. It had been a great vacation, but there wasn't much call for a veterinarian in space, or so I'd thought. One more jaunt, I told myself. It pays well enough to be worth it, and they clearly need my help. With a look about the room for anything I'd missed, I zipped the suitcase and shouldered my backpack, then canceled the rest of my reservation at the control panel by the door. A few more button presses, and the door whooshed open to let me dash off through the residential area, towing my suitcase on its repulsor plate behind me. That bag was much better than my old wheelie case, which was always tipping over when I turned quickly. This one did have a tendency to slide around like a toddler on ice, but I was an old hand now at pulling the strap just right to keep it from taking anybody out at the knees. And honestly, I usually walked at a more reasonable pace than this, but time was short. I glanced at a multi-clock as I passed an elevator hub. Sunset was coming for this side of the station. I wondered who had decided to make the station rotate in orbit instead of keeping one side facing the sun, but that was beyond my pay grade. Maybe it got too hot otherwise. Long lines at the food court made me slow down, edging past a variety of body types before I reached a clear area and picked up speed again. Success, I thought, didn't even bump into a scaly tail. This door, that door. I found the dry air breather's access port and hurried into the airlocks where steeply angled sunlight was streaming in. 
I only stopped once to swipe my ID in exchange for a cheapo force field exosuit. Just in case, the separation of dry air, wet air, and water left anything to be desired. I'd made that mistake once. One experience of scrambling for the emergency cutoff switch in an airlock rapidly filling with water was enough. Those Octo people breathe dry air, right? I fretted while I retrieved the exodisc. I think so. They just like more baths and moisturizers than I do. I'll be fine on a ship made for them. Assuming the one I talked to doesn't live in a scuba suit while on board, but surely they would have said, probably. With my ID back in my pocket and the control disc stuck to my chest, using technology that was basically the inverse of my suitcase, I shoved out into the spaceport in a cloud of my own air. I was greeted by more air, rows of parked ships under a glittering force field between us and the stars, and an impatient-looking green tentacle alien waiting in view of the airlocks. She waved me toward her ship as soon as she saw me. Strong arms, that's what they're called, I remembered. I guess I'll get a name for this one once we're on the way. With golden solar sails spread wide, the little round ship looked like a cartoon bat, or maybe a lemon, that wanted to be a pirate ship when it grew up. The epitome of dignity either way. I made a note to say nothing about that either. Right this way, stand back while the door shuts. The animal is in the cargo bay with more food and junk than any sane creature could eat in the time we've got. I'll introduce you after takeoff. The green strong arm didn't give me a chance to do more than nod as she spoke. For now, come grab a crash seat in the cabin. I'll introduce you to the crew after takeoff too. She sped down the narrow corridor with a quiet slapping of tentacles on the shiny blue floor. I did my best to keep up, despite having to bend over as I walked. This ship was not designed for a tall species. At least the walls and ceiling were a clean white, not one of those squishy organic ships that made my skin crawl. Got the human, she announced, as the door to the cabin spiraled open. She waved several tentacles back at me, one pointing at a chair near the wall that had a fighting chance of fitting me. Quick, quick! I ducked through the sphincter door, also gross but less so, waved at the dozen or so random aliens, then shoved my suitcase behind the chair and sat. The chair was cup-shaped and way too small, but at least the back was flexible. I could feel a localized gravity field in place of a seat belt. These folks have a lot of faith in their ship's power source, I thought, as I lifted my backpack to where it would give me neck support. Here's hoping we don't crash, for lots of reasons. The crew were mostly ignoring me, though in a polite way. Strong arms, frillions, and a few heat seekers, octo people, colorful fin-covered bipeds who looked like tropical fish that had learned to walk, and little lizardy folks, all air breathers, though two out of three had aquatic origins. As the engine hummed to life, I shut off my exofield. Damp air caressed my face, like someone breathing on me from uncomfortably close. Great. But it was breathable and wouldn't damage my stuff, and we were already in space judging by the view screen that had just registered some very quick movement. Only stars and a few distant ships were in front of us now. All right, introductions, announced the green, strong arm. You can call me Cam. What's your name, human? Robin Bennett, I said, sitting up straight. Earth animal expert at your service. Cam accepted that and rattled off the names of everyone else in the room then gave a quick rundown of the journey we could expect. Three standard days, no wormholes planned, no asteroid showers or other hoo-ha expected. And now that we were clear of the space station's shipping lanes, we could make good time and move about the ship. Cam hopped out of her seat and hit the floor with a wet smack. This way, animal expert, let's show you to your charge and your room. I grabbed my suitcase and followed, trying to be graceful while simultaneously ducking and high-stepping through the door. It was like walking around in a kid's playhouse. At least the cargo bay had a properly high ceiling. It also had many boxes of cargo and one metal cage with a very distressed cat. The I don't want to be here yodel echoed off every wall. Well, there it is, said Cam with a wince. It's been this loud the whole time. I hope that's not a cause for alarm. Not the sound alone, no, I said. 
Let me take a quick look. Hey, Kitty. I approached with a gentle voice and quiet footsteps. The tone of the cat's yowling changed when it saw me, aiming for pity over volume. Poor little gray tabby sounded very lonely. A nameplate with paragraphs of contact information said, PICKLE, in all caps. Hello, Pickle. There, there, Kitty. It's okay. I greeted the cat with a soothing babble of syllables, letting it sniff my fingers through the bars, only noticing once it quieted that Calm had stayed by the door. Oh, good, the alien said. It likes you. Will you want the whole crate in your quarters, I hope? There's enough room. Yes, definitely, I said, standing back up. The cat mewed in protest. Great. All the food and whatever should fit, too. Grab a sled. At Cam's directions, I helped maneuver a hover sled under the cage, then down the hall. She led the way with a different sled full of airtight cases covered in labels. Her cart was the more rattletrap of the two, which I appreciated. The supplies wouldn't be bothered by any jolts in height, but an anxious cat sure would. Pickle yowled all the way to my quarters, our quarters rather. Cam was eager to rush off once I said I had everything in hand, and I couldn't blame her, but the noise stopped as soon as the door shut. Mew? All right, Kitty, I said as I took off my backpack. That door seems solid, so you probably won't run off and get stuck under the brake pedal or however they fly this ship. Do you want to come out? Pickle didn't when I opened the door, but I made myself comfortable on the floor by the cage and read through the info packet that had popped up on my phone. Pickle was a girl cat, five years old, spayed, fond of cheese and toys that crinkled. Eventually, she crept out to accept some gentle scritches and a warm lap. I was considering moving to the giant squishy cushion that passed for a bed when the door chimed. Ow! Those claws were sharp when Pickle launched off me to hide in the carrier. I got to my feet painfully, shut the small door, then opened the big one. The ceiling was low in here, too. A maroon and teal frillion stood there, just barely short enough to stand normally in the hallway. Did you bring food, or would you like to join us for a meal? I looked back at the quiet cat. I do have some ration bars, but I wouldn't mind meeting everyone properly. Let me dig out some food for my charge here, then I'll be there. Which way? The Frillian gave me directions, then scooted off. I turned to the multiple boxes labeled food and checked the info packet. Pickle had preferences, but of course, she was too scared to eat. I left the tray of high-quality wet food inside the cage, alongside a dish of water and a well-chewed toy mouse that promised to have familiar smells. Then, I gave her some quiet time, and I got some fun time. The crew turned out to be outgoing and friendly, with many a joke ready about the types of food that my species was known to eat. They were mostly a carnivorous set, of one kind or another, fish, bugs, rodents, not a T-bone steak among the lot. They weren't phased by any kind of plant food, but the existence of dairy products as a whole was soundly denounced as vile weirdness. Honestly, it makes sense, I laughed. Milk is the first food we eat when we're born. Then we found ways to make it into a bunch of other fancy things. Yes, but why? Asked a bright red heat seeker, his lizardy face intent. Organic drippings sound like the absolute last choice of edible foods. Spoken by someone who has never tasted ice cream, I told him, or pizza. Those are some of the best foods out there. I've heard humans mention pizza before, said a large gray strong arm. He gestured with something that looked like an uncut sushi roll. What actually is it? I happily explained, then had to go on a tangent about bread, since that was apparently a weird human thing too. Really, none of you folks have food made of processed grains, I asked to a row of blank stairs. Guess not, but okay. It's crushed grain and water with yeast. Those are little microscopic creatures that help turn it into proper food. As I understand it, the air bubbles in the finished bread are their farts. I'm not doing a good job of selling this, am I? I swear it tastes good. The big strong arm laughed loudest as no, but keep going. You were going to circle back to Cheesy and why it's not rotten. I did my best, eventually giving up while insisting that they would probably like at least some of my species' barbaric dishes if they ever got a chance to try them. It was a fun conversation. And the food was all right too, 
A bit fishy, but I'd had worse. I was sad to see the meal end, with everyone scattering off to their various tasks, some of which might have been fun to help with, untangling cords, or organizing cases, or deciphering random space messages. But my duty was with the cat. Pickle was caterwauling loud enough to be heard from the end of the hallway. I hurried in and comforted her again, opening the cage and settling in to rest on the cushion bed with her snuggled next to me. With nothing else to do, I drifted off into a nap that was more restful than expected given the alien bed. I woke, braved the alien bathroom, then went back to sleep. Even after the vacation I'd been taking, it was a bizarre luxury to have no demands on my time. I didn't even know what kind of day-night cycle this ship was on, and it didn't matter. I slept as much as I needed to, ate a couple ration bars, fed and played with pickle, and I read a book I'd been meaning to get around to. It was nice. Crew members showed up occasionally to invite me to meals, but otherwise I spent the whole trip in my quarters, and as much as I enjoyed the camaraderie of dinner time, the guilt I felt every time I returned to piteous meows kept me from staying out longer. Yeah. I really would have liked to, though. They even had a music night with instruments I'd never heard of. There were spares that I was welcome to try. But Pickle had been scratching at the cage the last time I returned, and if she tore a claw because I wanted to know what an alien trumpet sounded like, then I would have failed in my duty. So I stayed with the cat who purred like an outboard motor, and I did some more reading. It was still nice, peaceful, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to take a turn at the radio station listening for gossip and distress calls, and triple encoded secret messages. The end of the trip caught me off guard. Cam showed up with a 10-minute warning before the time we needed to have the crate stowed in the cargo bay and me seated in the cabin. Already, I blurted, right, I'll be packed up in a jiff, got the sleds? In the rush of gathering things, ushering Pickle back into the carrier and hurrying to the cargo bay, I didn't really have time to feel things about the trip ending but I felt them anyway. I'd miss my little snuggle buddy. I hoped she had a good life ahead of her. The man waiting at the spaceport a few minutes later, as close to the landing pad as he was allowed, was a grizzled old space marine type. Stereotypes said he would have been more at home with some vicious beast as a pet, but I'd seen enough mismatched owners in my time to just smile at how eagerly he waited. And the way his face lit up at the sight of his cat was heartwarming. Pickles' distressed meows turned to welcoming mews when her human scritched her through the bars. I didn't have to remind him that he owed money before he could take her away. He was on top of that. Though I'm sure Cam would have made sure if necessary. The two of them handled the transaction with speed. Then to my surprise, he opened the cage there on the landing pad. Pickle clawed her way up his thick jacket to settle purring onto his shoulders like this was where she was meant to be. Maybe it was. Thanks so much for bringing her to me, the man said to Cam, with a nod to me as well. Gonna introduce her to the new family. Now everyone I love is in one place. Cam said a polite goodbye while I gave him a warm smile and wiggled my fingers at Pickle. The cat gave me a slow blink, purring hard and nuzzling his chin. Then the pair of them walked off to the rest of their lives. Come grab your stuff, Cam told me. He left a big tip, which I'll pass over to you. No way we could have done a thing to calm that creature ourselves. Thank you, I said. It was my pleasure. It really had been. Going home seemed anticlimactic now. It was just a pity I hadn't been able to socialize with the crew more. They were good people. I followed Cam back into the ship for the last time, or so I thought until a pair of crew members called from the radio station about a message from their sister ship. They had a fuel leak and only managed to coast into orbit of a moon four days out, said the small frillion. They need fuel, repair supplies, and extra food for their cargo. He looked from Cam to me. I don't know what planet the cargo is from, but if you don't have to be anywhere just yet? I grinned. I don't, as a matter of fact. I'll happily come along if you'll have me. Cam flipped a tentacle in what was probably a shrug. Why not? It worked out well just now. And I want to see if you can play a flange horn. 
Me too, I said. Let me just grab some provisions before we go. At least one of you folks has to try pizza. This was years ago now. I never did get a regular job back on Earth, and I don't regret it one bit. A couple crewmates did regret the pizza, but at least it was funny. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel. And for every comment that comments heart, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.